Hi, this is Phil Newman. I'm the editor in chief of Longevity Technology, and I'm delighted to say I'm joined today by tech entrepreneur and philanthropist, uh, Mr. Michael Antonoff. Hey, Michael. Hello, it's good to meet you, Phil. Great. Well, Michael, a real pleasure. And I guess the first question I'd like to ask you, which is um, really what, what made you decide after your pretty meteoric tech career to get into helping people with uh, extended lifespans and health spans? And, you know, do you see longevity as a technical problem that, you know, as a software architect, you would see a, a standardized problem? Well, um, I've done software for a very long time and uh, kind of loved, was kind of lucky to be a part of the Oculus story. And with that, like um, I've certainly dealt with a lot of complexity, just technically and also in building teams. And my mind is sort of analytical. So maybe about five or six years ago, at that time I was in Facebook, I was wondering, well, what is the most exciting, impactful thing I could do? And uh, like, I've done a lot in software and clearly I could continue digging and say virtual reality and other areas. Yet at the same time, I felt like we're all growing older and uh, I was wondering where is the technology of aging? That is, how well do we understand the biochemistry of us as humans? So I've actually decided to take a bunch of classes at night. I went through uh, courses at Berkeley Extension, sitting in the same classes as pre-med students, and also was inspired by the genomics revolution, which happened, and really fascinating about how our body these machines. And so that's really what got me there is really on one hand, being very sad about the fact that we as humans learn and try to better ourselves. And then we reach this part where we start to fall apart. And it's very sad, like my grandparents, I look at them and how much kind of challenge one can have in later stages of their life. And also the knowledge and experience the world uses, loses all the time. So I would have wanted to both see if something can be done about this and get also fascinating by just the science. Like if you think about software, we are these, uh, we can combine and make amazing things, but biology is much more complex, but it's also fascinating because we are these machines. So to answer your question is, it is a technical problem, yet it's much harder because in software, we know the instruction set, we can see all over the state. And in biology, I mean, maybe the closest we can get is like molecular dynamic simulations, but those have shortcomings. So we don't see many things yet and we haven't put it together. So while it's a technical challenge and I yes, I think we can ultimately solve it. It's a lot more multidimensional, has a lot more true unknowns. So, so do you feel that there is a, an approach in this, an analytical approach, whether it's software driven or whatever it may be, that researchers and, and investors themselves should be perhaps rethinking the way that they are approaching both the development of longevity therapies or investing in longevity therapies? Is there a kind of a, a, a magic uh, approach to this that perhaps people aren't pursuing at this stage? I don't know if there's like a magic approach. I think there is different aspects and avenues. So some people approach it from longevity pathways point of view, where, I mean, the core of longevity is that there is these aspects of our metabolism and things which happen, which ultimately affect and lead us to kind of develop these aging phenotypes and diseases. So if we can affect these things early and more fundamentally, then we can make progress. I think the challenge with therapeutics is they are very slow to develop and long, and ultimately will need many interventions. Not, not one thing is going to solve it. Another way to look at it is actually kind of more holistically and maybe at tooling and technologies which powers it, which what I like is how do we understand science and biology and investigate it much quicker so that we can iterate faster and and being at a point where we can actually develop these many modalities at the same time. So there's different avenues. I, there's not one big solution. Ultimately, I think what we need is I'd love to see more integration between 
these approaches between different companies and tools so we have a more flexible research platform okay very interesting so in terms then of your your active investment work that you do uh, you were an early investor in revel and underdog and i guess the question for you uh, michael is you know do you involve uh, your forming ventures activities at a later stage i mean do you have a kind of sweet spot that you work on where you're privately investing and then hand over to your team at Formic for the later stage? We really have one team and one process, but we do cover the gamut. Um, and I do like to invest in seed and series A or even pre-A, which is this magic spot where there's enough clarity about what the team is doing, but it's early that you can make a difference in your investment. So I feel like, from a point of financial impact, um, financial meaning empowering the team, it's usually the lead investor and the, or the top two checks which makes the biggest difference, right? Because without you, the company wouldn't be able to move forward. So that's why I try to play more in that space around seed and A where I can make a difference. Um, but in terms of the later stages, there's still these big themes which need support. So it could be um, areas of say AI tied to drug discovery or certain companies which already have a good strong platform and you believe in their mission and there is, you know, help is required, but it's also a financial opportunity because they might exit in a two or three years. And I think it's good to be diversified as an investor where you take bigger riskier bets where at a seed, you know, you can really make a difference. And at the later stages where you can maybe generate more cash flow while supporting the ecosystem you love, where you might be able to get money which you can reinvest later on uh, in a shorter period of time. So we do a bit of both. Okay, understood. And then if you were to look at obviously longevity as an investment category and were to say perhaps renewables and fintech are very mature, they would maybe be a 10. Uh, with your experience in Silicon Valley, where would you stay on a scale of one to 10 longevity investment is at this stage? It's actually a tricky question because you need to define longevity and separate it, say, from uh, drug development. So if you look at very early kind of, I do have therapies which affect aging as a whole, which have succeeded, well, I would say, I don't know of any, like there's drugs like metformin and things which there's some signal on. Um, there's lots of excitement, but it's really kind of early. I would say it's like a two. And the reason it's a two is we haven't shipped a thing. But if you look at drug development, because all most of longevity companies um, are actually targeting um, some kind of a therapeutic, often in areas that could be NASH, it could be fibrosis, it could be, you know, other things, that's a fairly developed thing. So that's like a mature industry of its own, which is a nine or a 10. So maybe a blade, blended weight is like a five or a six. Uh, so, Michael, do you see a difference between those more traditional investors in biotech, perhaps on the East Coast, and what you see with tech investors in Silicon Valley? Is there a difference between the two? I think maybe the valley is a bit more adventurous in a sense of kind of bright, like more aggressive ideas, which are more novel. And I think on a, you know, East Coast, it's a little bit more traditional biotech approach, but it's not a, a huge difference. I think there's really real innovation and collaboration working on both coasts. It's a much bigger difference, say, in Europe, where in Europe, you're going to have small evaluations and more incremental steps at any kind of startup. Yeah, understood. That would reflect what we we see a lot in the deal flow. And, and likewise, a lot of the innovation is still happening. I mean, is a lot of it is is US based, as, as you're aware. So let, let's talk about Formic and really the work that you do in, in Formic. I mean, do you have any um, tools or integrations or team activities that you do to help your investments progress, whether they're longevity or otherwise? Do you have a, an operating process within the fund? We generally sync up with companies um, every few, maybe three months, six months, 
and every once in a while there are discussions about well where are you and what are the next steps you need for your maybe next fund fundraise or the challenges how can the process be accelerated usually there's a few companies we work closer with and kind of more plugged in on the um, you know maybe every few weeks we talk and do something and uh, in other areas we're a bit more hands off I know that Formic is uh, very focused on, on innovation and committed to that. Uh, categorizing longevity, as we just talked about earlier, do you see that um, biotech and, and AI distills down to what you would consider to be longevity? Or would you, for example, as a fund, be looking at things a little bit wider than that, perhaps uh, aging in place technology or supplements or something of that nature? Do you have a, a definition yourself that you, you work within for longevity? I'd say longevity is probably more tied to pathways of aging for us. At the same time, as a fund, we invest in tooling by um, biotechnology quite a lot with the idea that if you can accelerate science in general and the progress and the iteration cycle, then you can actually move longevity forward. So, and it also makes it more diversified from just a strategic point of view, because a tooling vendor, let's say you're studying immune cells and droplets and their reactions, that type of technology can be on a market quicker than a drug. So, and it could enable multiple therapies to be, to be developed. In terms of, I mean, AI is a very broad term, it's applied to everything. So we don't blanket invest in AI, uh, we look at specific, stories of a specific company. Um, and clearly it's an enabling technologies for a lot of things, uh, very promising. Um, but, um, and I think age tech, not so much. Um, like we've actually invested in one exciting company called Springer Health, which is more around delivering, um, you know, they do phlebotomies which come on site and they clearly they could help elderly and all the people just be more effective and get healthcare quicker. So sometimes we look at those opportunities. I think the other thing you mentioned was uh, um, supplements. And, I, and that's a tricky one because I think there's a lot of work we can do, one can do in supplements, but it's also very hard to evaluate because there's lots of vendors and AI matters in determining what these things might affect, um, but it makes it hard to have an investment thesis because the marketing spin of your team could have a bigger impact on your supplement success than say the underlying science. Therefore, we tend to not invest in it much, even though I think in the future, a correct combination of supplements will help us quite a lot as humans. Absolutely, I mean, we, we consider that supplements that are pursuing not a you know a dedicated clinical pipeline but they are proving um safety and efficacy at different levels that is really important but, but i know michael that uh, you're very excited about cellular reprogramming and that you you guys invested in term bio so perhaps could we just maybe talk about that what you see in cellular reprogramming obviously as a as a software guy as well well i think cellular reprogramming is very exciting i think you're you know, listeners have heard about Yamanaka factors and can, how you can take a cell and essentially reverse its age, uh, making it a stem cell so you can reprogram it by applying some biological factors to be another type of cell. So the same process can be applied to just a little bit to shift the cell to a younger state. And that's super exciting. Like, as I learned about it, I just saw that this was a science which needed to be supported and investigated. I mean, the reality of it is we don't know what is it actually that is happening in epigenetics and cellular state, which what is the, how does a cell know how to change its state and how correct it is? So there's lots of risks there. Like I think early research had teratomas uh, when you ad administered to animals. So now we know ways of doing it, which are less troublesome, so I'm really optimistic, but the kind of, this is one area where I don't think it'll be a solve all, where nothing will and 
very, very narrowly, but it could have a huge impact on certain areas of aging and it could be a big factor. So what it got excitement at me is just a fundamental concept. You can take the state of a cell and take it to the past. And the reason I actually like turned by as one company I invested in, it was very early. Like when they didn't quite have the team they have now, and so it was from an investment point of view, most investors will say, this is super risky. And this is one of those cases where I was like, you know what, I want to write a check because I want this tech research to move forward. And if I lose that money, it's fine. Because I, you know, it's a, not many investors can do that type of thing, but it was, um, I'm very happy to see them progressing and actually the whole field like this clearly interesting work David Sinclair's lab is doing. There's a number of this like whole new support of industry of the field. So I'm super excited. Great. Well, that's an a, a opportune moment to drop off there, I'd say, Michael. So thank you so much for your time today. It's a pleasure speaking with you. And of course, thanks for all the uh, the work that you're doing to help the sector with, with your efforts and, uh, and of course, uh, your philanthropic work. So a great pleasure to see you today. All right. Well, it's a pleasure talking to you as well. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.